great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Barak Zahim is a consultant uh, veterinary surgeon uh, who recently joined us at King Abdulaziz University Hospital after his uh, uh, fellowship in King uh, Khalid Specialist Hospital. Uh, his uh, presentation is uh, on uh, monopathies, molar cells, and clinical practice. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdullah. So, modulopathies, modal cells in clinical practice. So, what are the goals of this presentation? First, we'll go over some of the basic sciences, especially the functional aspects of modal cells, and then I will present clinical cases or case studies where modulopathies are seen in medical and surgical retina cases as well. Now, before this, what do we mean by modulopathies? Because you will not most likely find this term in the literature. For the sake of this talk, monopathies indicate retinal diseases where motor cells are involved primarily or secondarily in the course of disease. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the basic sciences of motor cells, and as basic science knowledge in general might lead to uh, better uh, ways to predict, diagnose, and treat diseases. That's why for first year residents who are now taking the basic science course, this course is the most important course in your career, of course if you decide to continue as an ophthalmologist. Now, there are three main types of glial cells in the retina. The first is microglia, which has an important role in the host defense against organisms. And then we have two types of macroglial cells. We have motor cells, and then we have retinal astrocytes. And astrocytes are associated with the nerve fiber layer and blood vessels of the superficial vascular plexus. Microglia and retinal astrocytes are found throughout the central nervous system, but motor cells are specific to the retina. So what are motor cells? Motor cells are specialized radial glial cells, which span almost the entire thickness of the retina, extending from the interlimiting membrane, where it is formed by the basic membrane and the motor cell end feet, to approximately the area of the external limiting membrane. And they, they pass through the outer nuclear layer and then they turn obliquely in the hilly fiber layer. Now, close to the external limiting membrane, the microvilli of motor cells surround the photoreceptor inner segments. And this could explain what happened to this patient presenting with unilateral initial onset acute VKH to our uveitis team. So here we can see bacillary layer detachment which is basically adhesins at the uh, level of the inner segment myoid, where retinal tissue overlying the cyst is supported by motor cells in white color, but the floor of the cyst is not supported by motor cells, but fairly adherent to the underlying retinal pigment epithelium. And this makes the area in between vulnerable to a split seen in the inner segment myoid. And this is a three-dimensional uh, OCT reconstruction of basilar layer detachment in an eye with acute idiopathic uh, maculopathy, which is a uveitic disease, where we can see that there are suspended hyperreflective particles within the cavity that likely represent photoreceptor debris and inflammatory uh, uh, cells, including fibrin. And this is a short video uh, showing surgically induced basilary layer detachment during subretinal injection of gene therapy. We can now see the enlarging blip, now uh, temporal to the uh, macula. And then when the surgeon performed an intraoperative OCT, it showed the U-shaped basilar layer detachment. And this is a beautiful postmortem histological section in a patient with AMD, published recently by Bain Front and co-authors, showing an artifactual basilar layer detachment noted by the red arrows and asterisk. This further proves that the layer lying posterior to the motor cell outer processes is vulnerable to intra photoreceptor fracture. Now, the human retina contains about four to five million regularly arranged motor cells, and they provide crucial homeostatic, metabolic, and functional support. And each motor cell constitutes the core of a column of retinal neurons, which represent the smallest functional unit. So if we combine the two parts, we will have the straight radial unit found in most regions of the retina. But in the macula, motor cells display the Z-shaped morphology because the outer processes uh, accompany the, the centrifugally running photoreceptor axons in the hilly fiber layer, as we have discussed in the, uh, in the previous slide. So the question is, do the Z-shaped or straight courses of motor cells have other functional aspects? And the answer, according to the literature, is yes. 
the orientation, morphology, and directionality of mother cells change the physics of the incoming light. We know that the retina is inverted. Light of different wavelengths has to pass the entire thickness of the neurosensory retina before it arrives at the photoreceptors. So light may, may be scattered by different retinal cells and their organelles. And this backscattering decreases the visual sensitivity. And to reduce light scattering, non-phobia molar cells act as living optical fibers that guide the light through the inner retinal layers towards the photoreceptors. What about phobia molar cells, or the Z-shaped uh, uh, ones? When light is perpendicular to the molar cell plateau, as you can see in this example, almost all of it will be transmitted to cones outer segments. But when light, when, uh, when light hits molar cells at an angle, like in this example, some of light is partly reflected, which decreases the photoreceptor sensitivity. So again, this hypothesis says that there will be higher sensitivity to the incident light when it hits smoother cells perpendicularly, and that light sensitivity will be reduced when the light is tilted. And we are here describing a phenomenon known as the stiles crawford effect, published almost 90 years ago by Stiles, who was a physicist. He noted directional sensitivity of the retina to the incident light, and motor cells might have an effect on this sensitivity. Now, there is also another population of motor cells in the foveola called the motor cell cone, because it looks like an inverted cone in pink color. This specialized type of motor cells contributes to the maintenance and integrity of the foveal walls, which surround the central foveola, acting as a glue. We will discuss it later in clinical cases. The last point in basics is regarding visual cycle, where the photosensitive active retinoid, 11 cis retinal, is reproduced in the retinal pigment epithelium and then subsequently delivered into the photoreceptors. This works perfectly when the retina is attached. But when there is photoreceptor detachment from the retinal pigment epithelium, like in this patient presenting with acute central serous retinopathy, the visual cycle could be interrupted. But still, the VA can be quite good, as in this patient. So is there an explanation for the good visual acuity, although visual cycle may be interrupted? And one possible reason that can partly explain why visual acuity can remain reasonably well preserved may be that the molar cells may provide cones with an alternative intraretinal visual cycle. So that was the end of the basic part of this, uh, of this talk. And now we'll go over five clinical cases where motor cells have been affected primarily or secondarily in the course of a disease. Our first motoropathy case was referred to the retina clinic and she was having this abnormal OCT. She was 53-year-old, non-diabetic, and she stated that she was medically free and she was subjectively asymptomatic. The fundus exam was normal except for mild alteration of foveal reflexes in both eyes and the only imaging modality I have for her is this OCT. As you can clearly see, intraretinal cavitation, eye limb drape sign, attenuation or disruption of the ellipsoidal reflectivity. Now, I certainly do not have the experience of Dr. Noilati in diagnosing and following up patients with this disease, but I thought this was pretty straightforward. Macular angiectasia type 2, or mac -tel. But is it really yet? Now, the patient said at first that she was medically free, but it is common that when you ask about medications, you discover diseases and medications that are sometimes related to the eye. So when she was asked about medications, she showed me a box similar to this, Novadix tablets. Let me enlarge it so you can see the generic name, Tamoxifen. So she was taking it for almost five years after having breast surgery for breast cancer. So what is tamoxifen? Tamoxifen is a selected estrogen receptor modulator that is mainly used as an adjuvant treatment for patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And tamoxifen is well known that it causes tamoxifen retinopathy. The prevalence of tamoxifen retinopathy has been reported to be variable, ranging from 1.5 to 12% using the low dose, which is 20 mg per day. Now the treatment duration is usually more than four years, but it has been re reported to occur after two years of intake. It is bilateral in the majority of cases. In this series, it is 63%, but in other series, it is far, far more common to be bilateral. It is also asymptomatic in the majority of cases. Now, clinically, they can present with refractile deposits, foveal cavitation, macular holes, telangiectasia, 
and even right angle values. And I'm here, I'm like describing patients with MACTIL or macrophalangeal type 2. Risk factors include high BMI and dyslipidemia. Those are risk factors for tamoxifen And this is a multimodal imaging panel of a patient with tamoxifen retinopathy from a Korean series. You can see the crystals, foveal cavitation on OCT, capillary telangiectasia on OCTA, late hyperfluorescence on FFA, increased foveal and parafoveal autofluorescence on autofluorescence imaging, again, similar to patients with MACTEP. So, are we dealing here with macular telangiectasia type 2, or are we dealing with tamoxifen retinopathy? So, who is with MACTEP? So, the turnoilatic Who is with tamoxifen retinopathy? So, most of the residents are with tamoxifen retinopathy. So, let us see this recently published article, which may give us some insights <coughs> in how to make clinical distinction between the two. The title is Tamoxifen Related or Tamoxifen Retinopathy and Macular Telangiectasia Type 2 Similarities and Differences on Multimodal Retinal Imaging Published in Ophthalmology Retina this year. And they propose this nice table to differentiate the two conditions, and the most important findings are highlighted uh, by red boxes. And uh, as you can see, Tamoxifen Retinopathy findings usually confined to the central phobia or phobiola, while in MACTEL findings predominate temporal to the phobial center, as we, we already know. And that pigment plaques, macular nevascularizations, are usually found in patients with MACTEL. Now, when you look closely to the comparative analysis between the groups, the red boxes highlight the statistically significant differences, which are retinal graying is more common in patients with MACTEL, ellipsoidosome breaks are more common in patients with MACTEL, dileakage on FFA is more common in patients with MACTEL, and right angled venules are more common in patients with MACTEL. Now, are these really clinically significant differences for two different disease entities? Or maybe they describe different stages or phenotypes of the same disease? Because in other series with tamoxifen retinopathy, retinal graying was found in 70% of the cases, and a leakage in 53%, bridging the gap uh, between the two entities that was uh, presented by the, by the recent study. So other studies are needed to corroborate these findings. And this is a case report suggested that this patient was having MACTEL, and this MACTEL worsened with tamoxifen, and then 30 months after stopping tamoxifen, OCT findings and VA improved, especially in the left eye, meaning that there is a relationship between tamoxifen and MACTEL. And what is the most likely underlying pathophysiology? The answer is that they could be both modalopathies. We know from other studies that motor cells have an important role in the pathophysiology of MACTEL. And motor cells from basic science studies can, uh, motor cell stress can happen due to tamoxifen. But retinopathy or tamoxifen retinopathy is not found in all patients taking the low dose. As we have mentioned, only 1.5 to 12% of patients taking tamoxifen will have tamoxifen retinopathy. And the most plausible explanation suggested by a group in Oxford is that tamoxifen may have a trigger effect on genetically susceptible patients for developing MACTEL. And the best example for this is steroids-induced glaucoma. We know that steroids can induce glaucoma more commonly in patients with primary open angle glaucoma. But it is still glaucoma, and you cannot know if this is steroid-induced or not without a history of taking steroids. Likewise, we can say tamoxifen-induced MACTEL, which is thought to occur in genetically susceptible patients, but it might be still MACTEL, not a different disease meaning that it might be more accurate to label this patient as having tamoxifen-induced MACTEL or tamoxifen-related MACTEL until further evidence from future studies. So what we did is that we contacted the oncologist about tamoxifen, and uh, he said that he's already planning uh, to discontinue tamoxifen. I think they are usually giving the, the patient a course of five years, hoping that her vision uh, does not worsen. This was the end of the first neuropathy case. The second neuropathy case is a 24-year-old male, medically free, presenting with this OCT in November 2021. You can clearly see foveal cavitation, not a typical eye length rape sign, but there is prominent discontinuation of the ellipsoid zone. Importantly, no history of trauma and no history of laser if you were thinking about laser-induced maculopathy, and the other eye is perfectly normal. 
It is very close to the maxillary phenotype, except that the foveal cavitation in this patient is on the nasal fovea, while, as we know, in patients with maxillary, it is typically in the temporal fovea or in the temporal juxtafoveolar area. Now, you can think about the diagnosis, but just to save your time, this is the OCT of the same patient 17 months earlier. He was presenting with 2400 vision, multi-level skeptic changes, uh, and, uh, and the middle or outer the middle macular void. And you can see the extent of maculopathy by looking to the hyperreflective area on the near infrared reflectance image on the left uh, bottom. Now, you might have already suspected the diagnosis, and it is optic disc pit maculopathy. You can see the optic pit in white circle, and the patient was treated with juxta papillary laser with no success. And you can see the hypoautofluorescent <coughs> spots temporal to the optic nerve head uh, due to previous laser done elsewhere. Let us go back to the specific population of mover cells in the foveola called again mover cell cone, colored in pink in this cartoon. You can see that there is a horizontal part and a vertical stalk extending to the outer retina. And this population of mother cells helps keeping the foveal walls attached by an inward force. It also plays a major role in keeping the foveal contour normal. When we go back to our case on presentation, the macula was having a large outer lamellar hole, in which the outer processes of mother cells were disrupted, and the mother cell cone in pink color is detached from the outer retina, but still intact with no disruption horizontally. So, the mother cell cone, in our case, was keeping the foveal edges together, preventing full thickness macular hole. And when we follow the patient, we see that two weeks post-op, the elevated central fovea has dropped down significantly. And then, interestingly, two months post-op, the mother cell cone started uh, to look like a normal cone, as you can see. And then, and this is the, when you superimpose the, uh, the colors, and then 17 months uh, post-op, you can see uh, a normal foveal contour, almost a normal one, and then with persistent foveal cavitation, a possibly secondary to mulleropathy caused by the previous maculopathy due to optic disc pit. So it was fascinating to see um, how this maculopathy evolved post-op and the dynamic uh, role of mother cells, especially the mother cell cone. It is also interesting to see this report describing telangiectasia and the superior macula in a patient with optic disc pit maculopathy suggesting that mother cell dysfunction might lead to telangiectasia, like in patients with Mactel, for example. Now, going to the autofluorescence image, this eye was treated with laser elsewhere with no success. And we know from this nice article published in, in 2016 by the uh, Kekish Collaborative uh, Retina Group that juxta papillary laser, uh, uh, if combined with detrectomy, had or had no additional benefits. Other than this, there are several reports trying to plug the pit and being creative in it. For example, those authors reported silicon punctal plug to plug the pit. Other authors uh, reported autologous retinal transplant to plug the optic disc pit. Others have reported fibrin glue to plug the pit. And others have used autologous uh, scleral flap to plug the pit. And there are many others who use different things to plug it. And of course, they were all successful. What about a mutic membrane patch? And this series was recently published uh, about it, and out of 11 cases, nine had complete resorption fluid in one year. What about inverted eye lymph flaps bearing the uh, fovea? This study showed complete fluid resorption in 70% of the patients. And there are many other surgical techniques, but looking to the meta-analysis, a systematic review in the management of optic pit maculopathy, which compared six surgical techniques, namely vitrectomy alone, vitrectomy with laser, vitrectomy with eye lamp peeling, vitrectomy with eye lamp peeling and laser, vitrectomy with inner retinal fenestration, and vitrectomy with autologous platelet concentrate. With a total of 342 cases, the average fluid resorption was 70% in eight months, and tamponade had no effect on outcomes. And they concluded that they did not identify any significant differences in outcomes among six different surgical techniques. And here is a more recent meta-analysis and systematic review of 59 studies in active ophthalmologica with this table showing the anatomic and visual successes in all subgroups with pulled incidence of 85% in anatomic and visual successes using different surgical techniques. And the conclusion of, uh, of this recent meta-analysis was that 
PPV is effective for optic disc pick maculopathy and the combined application of gas tamponade, laser and ILM peeling should be used with caution. On the basis of the current evidence, it would be fair to say that the recommended procedure for the management of optic disc pick maculopathy is vitrectomy and should be done as the primary procedure in all cases. Now, other procedures like ILM flap, ILM flap, uh, ILM inverted uh, flap, and uh, amniotic membrane all have shown to be effective, but these can be reserved for cases that fail to resolve after vitrectomy. Going back to our patient, we did for him plasma vitrectomy plus SF6 with good outcome, but the role of gas was not known. Now, let us discuss another patient with optic fit maculopathy that I was consulted for recently. 20-year-old male, medically free, complaining of decreased vision in the right eye recently. He's, his VA is 20-25. OCT horizontal and vertical scans showed significant schesis that is involving the fovea, but no subretinal fluid. So who's offering PPV for this patient? So 20-25 vision, significant schesis due to optic disc fit maculopathy. Anybody who's offering detectomy? So Prof. Amro. Observation. So, so most of it. Okay. So let us see. Let us see these two studies about the natural history of optic pit maculopathy. In the first study, 52 cases were monitored. Another group of 27 patients were observed, or were operated. Sorry, and 77% of observed patients maintained a visual acuity of 2040 or better, and complete spontaneous resolution of fluid was seen in 19% of the cases. And they stated that in operated patients, and this is very important, that there might be evidence that observing patients until visual deterioration happens would not affect the anatomic and visual outcomes. And this is the most important piece of data in the paper. This table shows the long-term uh, visual outcomes of observed patients and divided them into two groups, depending on the presence or absence of subretinal fluid. And as you can see, the baseline and final visual acuity for both groups is almost the same after a period of three years. This is after conversion to Snellen visual acuity. And this is another study which was published last month on the natural history of optic pet maculopathy. 22 patients uh, were included and observed for three years, and the visual acuity at baseline and final uh, follow-up did not significantly change. And they concluded that when vision is good and subretinal fluid is absent, observation may be considered even when there is a remarkable, remarkable OCT findings. So again, going back to our patient who had a good vision with no subretinal fluid, and we opted to observe at least initially. But he came one month later with a VA of 2040, and subretinal fluid not shown here, and he was subsequently operated. So it seems that when patients with optic disc pit maculopathy present with recent visual symptoms like this patient, the risk of progression objectively and subjectively is higher. Now, sometimes macular schesis occurs and may look similar to optic pet maculopathy, but without an optic pet. And this case was taken from uh, a series studying vitrectomy for patients with macular schesis without a detectable pet, and they called it like optic uh, pet-like maculopathy without an optic pet. Out of eight patients, they operated six and all have variable reduction of interretinal fluid. But it's very important that before labeling a patient as having uh, optic pet-like maculopathy without an optic pet, other conditions of retinal schesis should be excluded, including snapper and other diseases, of course. And snapper is still like non-hereditary idiopathic fovea macular retinal schesis described in the SNAP series by Ober, Andianozzi, and other co-authors. Now, this was the end of the second molaropathy case. The third molaropathy case was a 64-year-old diabetic presenting with decreased vision in his right eye. His VA was 2040. He had mild PDR and ultrafovea reflexes with fovea cysts. And this is a 55-degree plot of fluorescence image, which was unremarkable apart from fovea and hyperautofluorescence due to displaced macular pigment by the cysts. Now, the OCT was really interesting. You can see a foveal cyst filled with hyperreflective material that is connected to a, sharp, a tiny sharp angle PED. The external limiting membrane and the ellipsoid zone were disrupted. Now, what is this? Is this a type 3 macular revascularization or DME 
or is it something else? This is the other eye, which looked good for the myopic stasis, and this is the OCTA, showing undetectable flow signal in the superficial and deep slabs, most likely related to the cystic changes, no macular vascularization, and there was no flow over the area of interest, as you can see in the bottom left image. And this is another patient who is 48 year old with type 1 diabetes who presented with vitreous hemorrhage, and we did vitrectomy for him, and this was his first post of OCT. As you can see, a foveal cyst with turbid content and a vertical hyperreflective line at the florus of the cyst disrupting the outer retinal layers. And this is a third patient who was 57, 57 year old, who are also showing the same, although less prominent line, but you can see the cyst and its connection to the retinal pigment epithelium. So these are the three cases uh, of TME which share a common phenotype. Again, a cyst with turbid fluid with a hyperreflective uh, line at the bottom of the cyst. And again, what is this? And this phenotype was actually published in one study as plume sign. And this study was, uh, was entitled Plume Sign in the Detergence of Macular Cysts, a novel OCT finding. So they described this phenotype as plume sign. They also described it as an inverted flask. And this is the plume on your left in Arabic Trisha, and this is the flask on your right in Arabic Dawra. An inverted flask would look like this. Now, these are three of the cases they presented. They look similar to our cases, a turbid cyst with a vertical hyperreflective line at the bottom of the cyst, and PAM is noted in the left OCT as well. VA was ranging from 2020 to 2040, except for the patient with PAM, who had a VA of 2200. So, what are the possible mechanisms for this phenotype? <coughs> One possibility is that this hyperreflective line is related to modal cell swelling and necrosis, which was <coughs> hypothesized by the study authors. Or it could be like uh, what usually happens in macular holes, as hyperreflective stress line that precedes macular holes. And indeed, the hyperreflective line in one of their cases progressed to an outer lamellar hole, and you can see how this turbid fluid is beautifully draining into the subretinal space. That's why they entitled their study as plume sign in the detergents of macular cyst. And also in our first case, uh, in which the hyperreflective vertical line turned into a hyperreflective one with an already drained turbid material. The diffuse hyperreflectivity on the left belongs to another cyst, as we'll see later. Now, their series of five, in their series of five cases, all patients were treated with topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops. Three patients ended with 2020 VA. Two patients did not show up, but presented with 2020 VA. And in our series of three patients, two patients received multiple anti-VEGF injections, following which the cysts became smaller. Uh, but the third patient, we don't have uh, long-term data, but he presented with a VA of 2025. So it seems that the visual acuity remains good before and after treatment in both series with a benign clinical course. What about Muller cell cone? We have mentioned that there were two cysts separated by a very thin line. So if we try to superimpose the Muller cell cone on this OCT, it would be like this, close to the, to the cartoon on your right. I mention this because disruption of this molar uh, cell cone in patients with cystoid macular edema is suggested to result in a degenerative lamellar macular hole with epiretinal proliferation as a wound repair process of the molar cell cone. Notably, degenerative lamellar macular holes are now known as lamellar macular holes only in the new classification, while tractional lamellar macular holes are, known, are now known as ERM phobia schesis. This is the study, if you want to read more. Now, another thing about the mother cell cone in diabetic macular edema is that disruption of the vertical stalk of mother cell cone, like this OCT below from a paper published earlier this year, may result in a poor initial anatomic response with anti-VEGF. When it is intact, like the OCT above, the initial response was found to be better. Now, this was the end of the third mulleropathy case. The fourth mulleropathy case was a 75-year-old male who was one-eyed, pseudophagic, and highly myopic. He presented to the ER with acute floaters in his seeing eye, and then he was referred to the surgical retina on call as a case of retinal detachment. 
Fundus examination was showing high myopia, large area for circular retinal atrophy, and wide macular staphyloma. But examination of the temporal retina was limited by corneal scarring and vitreous opacities, as you can see. But there was no obvious pigmentogenous retinal detachment. And this is the best quality OCT scan that we could get, showing what seems to be retinal detachment that is highly elevated, causing mirror artifact with a deep staphyloma. And this is the B scan uh, or show, uh, with a longitudinal cut at three, which views the macula, showing a picture of retinal detachment that was involving the macula. And this B scan was actually repeated and reviewed by an experienced ultrasonographer. And as you can see in the report, PVD with TRD extending to the equator, macula is off. Now, is this an RD requiring urgent PPV? Or is it something else? Well, the patient came complaining of bloaters only with no change in vision. And indeed, he was 2300, and his documented VA was the same years ago. Secondly, we tried laser in the area suspected of having retinal detachment. There was uptake in this area, uh, in white circle, although very minimal, uh, given the depigmented fundus and the limited view. And OCT was repeated with difficulty, but we were fortunate to get this raster scan. As you can see, high elevation of the retina, traction at the vitreo macular interface, and a deep posterior staphyloma. If you pause at scan number eight, in addition to the highly elevated retina, we saw remnants of retinal tissue still attached to the retinal pigment epithelium, at least in those areas, meaning that there might be some connections governed by molar cells uh, that are connecting the inner and outer retina, which cannot be seen, or it could be a large species cavity. If we see scan number seven, these two hyperreflective lines indicated by the red arrow might represent molar cell columns or radial units, and the white arrows show vertical defects which could represent lamellar or parabascular holes or maybe shadowing artifacts from vitreous opacities. So what are we dealing with? To my surprise, I found this study published in Retina Issue this month describing a, few, uh, a new phenotypic entity entitled Extreme Macular Schesis Simulating Retinal Detachment in Eyes with Pathologic Myopia. We may all know about the new classification of myopic traction maculopathy proposed by Barbara Carolini from Italy, who elegantly described the perpendicular and tangential evolution of, traction, of this traction maculopathy. We see here in yellow, in your left side, that the perpendicular evolution can result in progressive schesis and finally macular detachment. But if this schesis was so severe to the extent that it looks like a retinal detachment, then it is called extreme macular schesis simulating retinal detachment, abbreviated as EMSSRD. So this new phenotypic entity was defined by this recently published article based on OCT as high elevation of the retina, more than 500 microns, less obvious or even absent columnar structures, which are considered to be molar cells, and the presence of thin remnants of outer retinal tissue above the retinal pigment epithelium. And this is a representative OCT image of an eye with an EMSSRD. You can see the thick cases and the remnant retinal tissue above the retinal pigment <coughs> epithelium. So, this is not a macular hole related retinal detachment. Practically speaking, this is a lamellar macular hole with a predominantly outer retinal schesis. And these are the other images of extreme macular schesis uh, uh, simulating retinal detachment magnified below, showing clearly the remnant retinal tissue. So they identified 25 eyes with a mean follow of 7.5 years. 68% of the cases had an increase in the schesis cavity. 28% had a stable schesis thickness, and in one case, for 4% of the cases, the schesis disappeared. Now, 40% of eyes needed surgical intervention. Half of them was due to macular hole related retinal detachment, and the other half was due to progression of EMSSRD, both subjectively and objectively. But importantly, those 40% of eyes which required surgical intervention there was no statistically significant difference in pre- and post-operative visual acuity, possibly due to macular atrophy and the initially poor visual acuity with history of macular neovascularization. So back to our case, considering the stable VA for years and only floaters as a complaint, we considered him as having extreme macular schesis that simulated retinal detachment 
and we opted to observe closely in few days and then one to two weeks, and he was stable, and then his follow-up was extended. So this was the end of the fourth mineralopathy case. The last mineralopathy case is not a case that I personally saw. This was presented by Jonathan Smith in the last year at a meeting. But I remember very well that during my fellowship, a patient who was having 2030 vision while silicon oil was in situ, and then following silicon oil removal, his VA dropped significantly to hand motions. That's why I brought this case. I didn't find the file number of that patient. So this is a 42-year-old patient who underwent pulchonopitectomy and silicon oil or macula on retinal detachment. And his VA was 2080 under silicon oil. Post silicon oil removal, his vision dropped to hand motions. And this is the OCT post silicon oil removal. So you can see clearly the microcystic macular edema in the inner nuclear layer, predominantly in the nasal macula. And segmentation analysis showed thinning of the nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell layers compared to the other eye, which signify inner retinal thinning, which is common in eyes with silicon oil related vision loss. And there is a relatively standardized definition of silicon oil related vision loss by the British Ophthalmological Surveillance Unit. So silicon, silicon oil related vision loss uh, was defined as an unexplained vision loss following removal of silicon oil of two or more lines of snail visual acuity and or deterioration of VA to worse than 2200 from BCVA with silicon oil in situ in patients presenting with primary RRD. Of course, this should not be attributed to any identified cause. And using this definition, they found 14 out of 522 cases of oil-related vision loss, which was equal to 2.7%. All occurred at the time of silicon oil removal, and these data uh, were unpublished from the uh, uh, British Ophthalmological Surveillance Unit. Now, what about other studies? The incidence was 5.9%. Uh, in a study published by the Pan-American Collaborative Retina Group, 3.3% by a group in more fields, and 4.9% using the heavy silicon oil. But the largest study was the one above, with an incidence of 2.7%. Now, I brought this case because there should be something related to mineralopathies, as you'd expect. Jonathan Smith did not talk specifically about mother cells, but when we reviewed the literature, we found that after excluding patients with vascular and inflammatory conditions, they are called vasogenic macular edema. So if we take patients with non-vasogenic macular edema, microcystic macular edema has been reported in two major pathologies. The first is optic neuropathies, regardless of the cause, whether it is inflammatory, glaucomatous, hereditary. And the mechanism is retrograde transsynaptic degeneration, which involves molar cells, leading to molar cell dysfunction, which decreases fluid absorption from the retina because this is one of the functions of mother cells. And this will result in microcystic macular edema. The other pathology is epiretinal membranes, which can occur preoperatively, caused by the traction and contraction of the membrane, and can also occur postoperatively due to retrograde maculopathy due to mother cell death caused by ILM peeling. So ILM peeling as we have discussed last week, may not be complication-free, even if it seems to intraoperatively. Now, specific to silicon oil removal, one of the motor cell functions in maintaining homeostasis is to buffer extracellular potassium concentration by siphoning it into the vitreous cavity. When silicon oil replaces vitreous fluid, it is thought that the buffering function of motor cells are disrupted and during silicon oil removal, sudden change happens in the potassium concentration leading to cellular apoptosis and then vision loss. And this uh, is the conclusion of our clinical cases. At the end, I have to acknowledge Hendrik Muller for his discovery of Muller cells among other discoveries. And maybe it is suffice to say what Hirschberg wrote in one of his publications uh, in, in, uh, in 1919, and I quote here, the most ambitious students of ophthalmology at the time wanted to study anatomy in Würzburg with Henrik Müller, physiology in Heidelberg with Helmholtz, and clinical ophthalmology in Berlin with Albrecht von Grieb. So those were the giants of the 19th century. And again, for first year residents, you will hear about Hirschberg in Cornell Lighter Flex Test, and you will hear about Helmholtz when studying about the theories of accommodation, and you will know about von Grieb when studying for thyroid orbitopathy. Thank you. for this.
this very informative and excellent lecture. Uh, I will open the floor for any questions uh, or comments from the audience. I'm at all. <laughs> so, really, uh, I have no questions. I have a question. So, <laughs> so we, we go back to, let's say, the patient with Snapper, because this can happen commonly. Yeah. So, let's go to the OCT. This one. So, Barry, now uh, you consider molars are not, uh, not only skeleton of the retina, but yep. also it has a significant uh, yes. physiological function. Right? Yes, they have mechanical and physiological ah, functions yes. as well. That what we know until now. Yes, absolutely. Yes. 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 So, so my question is that this is a patient which was published in one of the series, one of the last series in patients with Snapper. And they say that this patient is not actually optic pit maculopathy because you know there are some reports uh, saying that optic disc pit maculopathy can occur without an optic disc pit, suggesting a micro -pit. But what are the differences that would make you label this patient as having snapper and make you go away from optic disc pit maculopathy? Let's say there was no optic pit, this is one thing, but what, are, what other things that you would think of? Or let's say even other differential diagnoses of schesis. This might present to any one of us in the clinic. Medically free patients. So let's start, what are the differential diagnoses of schesis in the macula? So we know that optic disc pit maculopathy is one, and we know that X-linked retinal schesis is another one. Yeah? It's not in the same plane. Yes, it's, it is not in the same plane. This is one of the, yeah. the, the, the differences. And it, this can happen also in dystrophic conditions, although a little bit different. But for example, patients with enhanced ESCON, they might have uh, significant schesis involving the macula. Again, it's not in the same plane. They're it's not in the same plane, yes. It's mostly inner nuclear, where, where this, where this can be a suggestion of optic disc pit dystrophy. Yes, so best is another one. So one of the things that make you label this patient as having snapper is one, this schesis is in the helifiber layer, okay, which is very common. In patients with optic disc pit maculopathy, it is common that you will have multi-level skeptic changes. So as, uh, as in our patients, so we have schesis in the nerve fiber layer, outer, outer uh, retinal layers and inner retinal layers. So this is one. So the second thing is that patients with snapper typically present when they are 60 years old or, or, or more. So they are older patients. While patients with optic disc pit maculopathy, I mean at least the patients that we have seen, they usually they present during their 20s or 30s. And the other thing is that uh, this, is, this was published in a new series, uh, I mean, last year or something like this, that patients with snapper are commonly having peripheral ethnoschesis. But of course, you have to do the genetic testing to exclude uh, variants in RS1. So are there any questions? But, uh, but in this finding also, it's really common in most of, of patients with retinal detachment. We operate this patient, and you see the patient, the vision is good. You get your CT here, and you see this, this uh, fluid over the, the fovea here. And usually these patients, they were labeled as treated as a patient have macula edema after the care. But if you can put any drops into the eye, it doesn't work, and the vision output is the same. Yes. So probably the same mechanical thing also causes that thing, which is an impairment of the muller cells, some of it goes into the retina. The same way you do the show the, the yes. uh, optic maculopathy here, the fluid dissects into the layers of the retina, okay? And that probably was the cause of that. Yeah, this is a possibility. So patients, especially with subacute or chronic retinal detachment, you know, the fluid can percolate inside the retina, which causes, I mean, after retinal folds, interretinal skeptic changes, which also affects the prognosis postoperatively. So, uh, so yes, I agree with you. I have a question. Uh, how about uh, like you know? It's now very common that we do eye peeling in uh, uh, a lot of cases, whether it's macular hole or like diabetic retinopathy, traction detachment here, here. And it seems to be an easy step in surgery to just remove the eye limb and uh, you know get on with it, so that you don't have recurrences of memory. But have you come across uh, some studies about? Uh, effect of iron peeling on the molar cell uh, health and pathology. 
Yeah, so at least there are two studies. One of them I have presented uh, here, but that was a speculation. And they say that microcystic macular edema can happen postoperatively. And the reason for this is retrograde maculopathy caused by ILM peeling, which led to uh, mother cell death. The other thing, there was a recent published study, I think one or two months uh, from now, about the visual sensitivity uh, or macular sensitivity post uh, ILM peeling. They found that patients post ILM peeling, the macular sensitivity decreases. And this might be also related to modulopathy. Yes. <coughs> True. Uh, and even uh, also a uh, uh, huge study of macular uh, macropause along with uh, uh, regnatogenous attachment with a uh, peripheral bone. And they compared those with uh, macular uh, ILM peeling and non uh, ILM peeling. And they found that fusion with in these cases where no ILM was better. And I have a long time when we started uh, peeling the posterior hyaluron. In fact, there are studies uh, or electron micro, uh, microscopic studies of whether there is ILM in the back surface of this uh, PVD or not. And in fact, uh, most of the surgeons, they were trying to avoid uh, peeling the ILM along with uh, when there is any resistance so that uh, we thought at that time that uh, it is uh, an important structure. And I think we, Just now we, uh, we uh, deal with ILM peeling lies like uh, a piece of paper. But I think we should really rethink about this. And pro preventing, sometimes we will extend peeling all over to prevent little uh, epithelial membranes and all this. But we are very negligent about the physiology of the I agree with you. So sometimes less is more. So. Island feeding should be done when it is needed. So if it's not needed, you might feed it. I'm, I'm really happy about the cases that you showed with the big cyst in the diabetic myelopathy, where there is a disruption of the molar, molar bands. And uh, not, thank you. Not not this one, but there is one where you showed a very thin thin walled cyst. You know where there is disruption. So you showed show the, the difference. Cases. Yeah. Is it this one? Uh, there, there's this one, and then there's there is one where you showed uh, uh, two pictures. One where there were okay. several. So you these, know, these are the cases the that uh, we have seen. So these are the three cases we have seen. Yeah, but but, but then you, you compared. You, you meant, but uh, then you were, in your conclusion when you were talking about you know the differences between between a uh, cyst you know that has a good prognosis and yes, other yes, cysts yes, that yes, doesn't yes, have yes, a good yes, prognosis. Yeah, and, you mean uh, the study? Yes. Yeah, and uh, this is really important. And you know, I mean, when when residents and the follow fellows go rotate with me, I, and when I see this kind of cyst that is thin walled, you know, with absolutely almost no structures inside, what happens and when you give anti vegf is basically you you collapse the cyst to a certain degree. And sometimes it becomes a little concave, actually, okay? And then basically it fills again. But it, even if it heals, which is very rare, even if the inner and the outer you know, surface of this cyst heals, uh, there is no visual improvement. And, it, and it basically it goes back again. So in those cases, I, I personally don't even give that knowledge. I, I've learned how to stop because I think you don't have the structure that keeps the retina on. You have disruption of the, of the signal already, you have no cells there, so the visual signal doesn't pass through there, so I I, uh, so I think it's important because, uh, right, like Dr. Amru said, you know, we, we take things for granted and we do ILM, you know, without really thinking, but uh, sometimes, uh, I'm feeling without thinking, but also sometimes we do anti-vegic without, without really thinking, so so it's, it's a, I think it's important not to over, over treat. Thank you very much, Dr. Anuela, for this comment, because... You know, nowadays we have a lot of uh, diabetics who are on chronic anti-VEGF and we're just injecting, injecting for the swelling, it improves, it goes back, the patient doesn't improve vision. And I think we have to start having a point of, of you know, when to stop anti-VEGF. Yeah. When is it not successful? When is it just giving the patient more harm, the risk of endophthalmitis, etc. And, you know, hospital visits are unnecessary. And this is probably one of the uh, signs that you yeah. should look for. And, and this is why it's really important for me to, to actually look at the structural OCT and really layer by layer, look at the raster as much as possible instead of just look, look, looking at the map, you know, to say, okay, there's thickening center involved, not center involved. You really need to look at the structure and see if there's disruption of tissues. Yeah. But, but again, um, I, I think this is one of the best grand rounds I've seen in many years. So I really want to congratulate you and take this opportunity to thank you because I think I'm going to go back and, and listen to this repeatedly. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh,
thank you for this uh, uh, interesting and very excellent, uh, well presented uh, lecture about uh, melodopathies. This shows that we still don't understand a lot about uh, molar cells. Uh, as Dr. Amro and Dr. Nevalati and you've mentioned, that uh, molar cell is one of the cells within the retina, so it should be respected, not killed during surgery without any, any second thoughts. Uh, the food processes are part of the set. It's not uh, an extra uh, appendages that you should peel. Uh, molar cells are also uh, involved in, and uh, in it is the only cell within the retinal layer, as you know, that uh, has an endocrine function. And this endocrine function is involved in the enzyptic changes. And now the thinking is that diabetes is a neurological disease before it's... Uh, so the loss of pericytes might have... Might maybe uh, the, the idea of a loss of pericytes as the first, change, uh, first uh, pathologic change within the retina might change into the abnormality in the molar cell endocrine function involving the renin and utensil system. So uh, as much as possible, we should maintain this structure uh, unless it is uh, really needed to remove it. Thank yes, you. Uh, I agree with you. So, molar cells, uh, if someone wants to read about it, uh, this publication, actually in 2013, was a 27-page publication. So, if you are interested, you can read. There are many, many sub-functions of the molar cells. Some are pro proven and some uh, were speculations, but we're still learning about it. behind the uh, whole thing is not going to hold. And I was thinking about also the presence of the tangential traction causing that track, then eventually causing the whole thing is not going to hold. And that's what makes it a film sign, a central cyst, then tangential traction, then eventually sure. a macular hold. So the pathophysiology of macular holds in most of the time is due to vitreo macular traction. Okay, so when there is vitreo macular traction, there is stress on the fo foveal mother cell cone, as we know that one of the functions is to keep the foveal walls attached. So when there is stress on, on this part of mother cells, you cause chronic irritation. And chronic irritation leads to some sort of inflammation. Now we don't know, but I'm speculating. So, and this inflammation leads to gliosis. So gliosis is, is basically a fibrosis, but of the glial cells. Now when this gliosis happens, it, uh, it is it presents in OCT as a hyperreflective line, which means that there is stress, okay, and macular hold can happen at any time, okay. Sometimes you see this hyperreflective line after macular hold surgery, which means that the two edges of the of the macular hold are now trying to to remodel. Now, in the case of cystoid macular edema in patients with DME, this is something different. Yes, CME, if it is, I mean, it's severe, it can cause a, a macular hole, but the pathophysiology in, uh, in, this, in this disease is different. So, first you have a cyst, I mean, exertive cyst from the, uh, from the foveal capillary, and then one of the mechanisms to drain the, this, this is a speculation again, so one of the mechanisms to drain the intracystic fluid is to open a hole in the outer retina. And then this hole will make it easier for the retinal pigment epithelium to drain the fluid. That's why, again, the study was entitled Plume Sign in the Detergence in the Dryness of a Macular Cyst. So they said that when this happens, this means that this cyst will dry in a in, in few months using topical and steroidal anti inflammatory drops. Go ahead. No, I'm just curious. I think it's really interesting what you put about uh, these uh, unexplained visual loss in the silicon oil removal. Okay. So I think we do. when we speak about this pathology here, there's a lot of things involved into that. You know, you need another surgery to remove the silicon oil. And there is a lot of changes that happen during the surgery here that also couldn't explain what's happened to the patient. So the thing is, 
the numbers are very low. What we use so much siliconoid right now, it was frequent to see here, we see much, much more cases like that. And the identity is, for me, it's difficult to understand why it happens, because we see the OCT and there's no change in the OCT here. So maybe it could be related to something happening in the perfusion of the OTD, so something vascular effect here, that we are not aware into that, and we cause uh, um, the, this cause here, because the pictures, honestly, you, you show in the, in the OCT here, I cannot explain why the patient is losing vision because your other retina is perfect. But the inner retina is not. Yeah, yeah. So, Definitely. So the, the inner retina is affected in those patients, but the question is, what is the cause? What is the cause of this inner retina being affected? Is it due to optic neuropathy? I mean, not related to silicon oil, because you know, patients with silicon oil they can have glaucoma, and then when they can have glaucoma, they can have glaucoma-related maculopathy because this is another entity. And in glaucoma maculopathy, you can see also microcystic macular edema. Also, when you remove silicon oil, commonly we do through their exchange. And sometimes the view is not good. And it is not uncommon that we touch the optic nerve head. And this is one other possibility. So yes, there are many possibilities. Any other questions? Thank you again, uh, Dr. Tarek, for this very nice and informative lecture. And, uh...